Yeah, but he's deliver a message. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Maybe everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. There's a chamber of commerce for gays and lesbians. Oh, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, okay. I used to have a lot more to do with the chamber of commerce in our town, but I don't. Columbia, Maryland. But on the healthcare issue, I, knew, I felt they were not really participating in trying to find a solution. And that, and, uh, that was a, a real issue for me. And I worked with them for a couple of years, and I could see every time anything came up, it was not, you know, they weren't there to give in. Rather than you know, raising their thinking up to the chambers actually across the country, and uh, we see a lot of that. <laughs> and they default to the, um, the state. Yep. Petition a lot of times. And the, the thing is that when people are willing to actually sort of work and try and do a solution, I, I, don't, I don't know why they de still default to a, a you know, position that perhaps doesn't represent small businesses. Not. And our chamber is really uh, the power is in the developer, the banker, the financial sector. You just look through the book and you see that's where it all is. And that's a different world compared with us. You know, trying to get insurance. You'll see the red button. You'll see the red light come on, and then when you're finished talking, just press it again, and it goes. Great. All right. So now I have my instructions. So, very much appreciate your coming to the White House today to talk to us about small business and health reform. And this is something that uh, the president's very committed to: health reform that will help small businesses who are struggling as the cost of health care continues to skyrocket. And we are releasing a report today on www.healthreform.gov uh, called Helping the Bottom Line, Health Reform and Small Business. And I think each of you has one of these at your place. And it highlights how the high cost of health care burdens small businesses, weakens our economy, and leaves millions of Americans without the affordable health care they need and deserve. Um, I was looking at this last night, and I just want to mention a couple of the facts in here. You all will speak to these things, but th these things were staggering to me. Um, we already know that a large fraction of the uninsured workers are in small businesses. Um, the last figures I saw are that about a third of the uninsured, 13 million people, work in firms with less than 100 workers. So it's right where you live. Small businesses are burdened by rising health care costs, and Americans who run the millions of small companies around the country have seen their insurance costs consume a greater share of their payroll. High costs are making it impossible for many small businesses to provide insurance to their employees. In one national survey, nearly three quarters of small businesses that didn't offer benefits cited high premiums as the reason. And one reason that small businesses feel this pinch is that they pay more on average for administrative uh, services with insurance like marketing, enrollment, and premium collection. 40% of small businesses said that health costs have had a negative impact on other parts of their businesses. And I'll be especially interested to hear about that from you. Uh, for example, uh, that it contributes to um, high employee turnover or preventing you from growing your business. And I'd be particularly interested in hearing how it's affected you. Um, I know I don't need to tell you more about the struggles that you're facing with rising health care costs, because that's what you're here to talk about to us, about how you face and deal with those struggles in your personal and professional worlds. So I just want to tell you the President's committed to enacting comprehensive health reform this year that will help small businesses with their health care costs. 
Um, he believes that comprehensive reform should lower cost, guarantee choice of doctors and plans, and ensure quality and affordable coverage for all Americans. And we're actively engaged with small business owners around the country in regional forums and discussion groups like this one. In fact, that, that's how we found many of you. Um, and through our website, which is called www.healthreform.gov, where the report that I just mentioned is on today and where um, our discussion this morning will be um, live streamed right now. So we really want to hear from you and want to keep hearing from you as we work together to get health reform passed this year. Um, I want to first go around the room and let people introduce themselves. And um, I met most of you out in the hallway, but I'm Nancy Ann DeParle, and I work for the president as the director of the Office of Health Reform. And my colleague to the left here is Dr. Bob Kocher, who's one of the MDs who are working with us here at the White House and works with Larry Summers at the National Economic um, Council. And Larry Summers uh, hopes to drop by here later, so because uh, he wanted to hear from you as well, and uh, hopefully he'll be here. Um, we'll start with you, please. Yes. Good morning. My name is my name is Dr. Melba Benelli. My doctorate is in dental medicine, and I'm from the Marlton, New Jersey area, where my practice is, and I live in the city of Camden, New Jersey. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Robert Huang. Uh, I own a small printing company in uh, Forest Church, Virginia. Um, my name is Paula Kalamafta. I'm the chair of the Small Business Council of America. Um, we're a group that represents sort of the larger segment of larger small businesses out there, and most of our members do offer health insurance. Good morning. I'm Jody Hall, and I own a business in Seattle called Cupcake Royale, and we have four, soon to be four locations. We're opening our fourth. Uh, we've been around for five and a half years, and we have about 60 employees. And I'm what happened? Well, <laughs> we'll talk later. <laughs> Hi, Michelle Demrod with the National Federation of Independent Business. Um, we are the largest small business advocacy organization in the United States, and we represent about 350,000 small business owners, average size of about 10 or fewer employees, all independently held, nobody publicly traded, and about half of our members are in a position to be able to afford to offer insurance. Thank you, and thank you for having us. Jamie Borromeo with the National Council of Asian American Business Associations. I'm the executive director. We represent over 120 Asian business organizations throughout the country with a network of 38,000 small business owners. Hi, my name is Mark Derbyshire. Uh, I'm in the moving and storage business part of United Van Lines. Uh, I'm in Aberdeen, Maryland, have about 30 employees and provide health insurance. Terry Gardner, a lifelong business owner, and now I work with the Small Business Majority advocating for comprehensive national health care reform that will work for small businesses. My name is Jane Hewley, and I own the dog shop here in Washington, D.C., and I have five employees, and I do provide health insurance, but it's a big strain. And I already asked Jane if she brought anything for Bo, the president's <laughs> dog. <laughs> I did Because I <laughs> might be able to make it arrange an appearance if you yeah. had brought him something. And well, you know, I, I can make him, you know, do some tricks or something, <laughs> teach him something. Um, we'll do that next time. Right. My name is Bill Daly. I'm with the Main Street Alliance. We have uh, 16 affiliate organizations in 16 states that represent small businesses advocating for health care reform. I'm Louise Hardaway, and I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. Great. And uh, glad to meet uh, another Tennessean, Nancy. Um, I actually work in the hemophilia home care business and am currently not owning my own small business because I was forced into working for a larger employer mm -hmm. in order to have health care coverage. Mm -hmm. That's right. We're Chris on. Link with Imagination Branding, Nashville, Tennessee. We're a promotional marketing company. Um, my wife and Jan Nathanson started the company 20 years ago. Three women and uh, had the good fortune of being hired in by the boss. And uh, you'll hear from her shortly. Great. And I'm the boss, Becky Link from Imagination Branding in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, starting our 20th year in uh, promotional marketing. 
I'm Todd McCracken. I'm the president of the National Small Business Association. We're the oldest national small business organization. Um, and we've been an advocate for comprehensive reform of the healthcare system as the only way we're finally going to grapple with the difficulties that small businesses face for many years now. Hello, my name is David Ferrer. I'm Vice President of the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. We represent about two and a half million Hispanic owned businesses, average size of 20 employees or less, and we are very much uh, looking forward to comprehensive, a comprehensive health care reform. Hi, I'm uh, Kate Karras Mann. I'm with the National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce. We have about 47 chambers across the country, and we represent about 29,000 members who employ about 150,000 people. Uh, my name is Brian England. Uh, my company is British American Order Care in Columbia, Maryland. Uh, we've been in business for 31 years, and it's joint owned by my wife and I, and uh, we provide health care coverage, try to. Thanks. Well, I want to get right to the topic that I raised at the beginning of what you're facing right now as you look to try to provide coverage for your workers. Jody, why don't you start us off? You're out in Seattle, and what do you find in the market out there? Tell me again how many employees you have. Yeah, we have currently, we, we fluctuate a little bit, but we're, I think we're right around 55 to 60 right now. Um, we're getting into wedding season, so we hire quite a few mm -hmm. more people, and we're opening a new store as well. So um, I guess my story is that I started in, I started for a small business that became a huge business. Uh, I worked at Starbucks Coffee when they were a tiny little company. Wow. And grew up there, learned a lot about how to run a business and how to treat your employees well. And I spent 12 years there, amazing values. They offered health insurance if you work 20 hours a week. So of course I took these values into my own business when I started it. And when I offered health insurance, it was, it was just it's a human thing. It's important that the people who work for me uh, have health insurance. I mean, it makes me more viable to, for, to attract great talent, et cetera. But I was shocked at the high cost. Um, working for Starbucks, I think we paid 25% and the company paid 75, so I kind of did a similar deal. We probably paid about 45% more for, quality, for the coverage that was probably much less than half. We didn't have... Uh, 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 vision or dental. Uh, it was more of like a catastrophic kind of plan. Um, so, you know, uh, I really I really want to offer health care and continue to do that. Right now, we, if somebody works 25 hours a week, we offer that. But what's happening is costs go up every year. And because of privatized insurance, they really have a corner on the market. So I can't shop that. I can't go to different brokers and get a better rate. What I'm forced to do is decrease the quality of coverage to continue to be able to afford some level of health care. How do you buy it now? You go to a broker who shows you what's you available? Buy every, you buy through a broker. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And, and what I'd like to see and why I'm here today is just to, to ask that you and the president uh, listen to the options for creating a choice for public health care. And I, what that will do for small businesses, we are, we're the majority of working Americans and we're the largest pool of unemployed or uninsured working right. Americans. So, but we're also the busiest, you know, we're our own HR person, marketing person, et cetera. We don't have a lobbyist to come to DC. It's hard to get us out of our businesses. So it's important that for this meeting because we need to organize and help help you understand kind of what the real world of our of what we what we face. So I'm looking at ten to forty percent increases every year and I, I don't have the option to shop that. It's incredible. Like I can't I can't do that to my customers. Oh we're just gonna increase your it's a free market. They're gonna well, go what I was else. gonna ask you what do you you said your premiums went up forty percent for this that you're paying this year. So what did you do? Did you raise the price of cupcakes or we did end up raising the price of cupcakes a little bit to, mm -hmm. to absorb that. I mean we offer we sell coffee and cupcakes. So I feel like I'm one of the fortunate businesses that can't afford it, mm -hmm. but I'm just absorbing it. So our you know our opportunity to do other things, to grow our company, et cetera, we risk that that money. And honestly we'll probably have to decrease our coverage, which I don't think is good for this economy. And I don't think it's good for other businesses, if people want to start their own business, that doesn't sound attractive. You're going to have to pay these high health care costs for less quality coverage. 
why would you want to go into your own business? Yet that's the engine of our economy. I mean, I think this would be a great opportunity to stimulate our economy if we can have a public health insurance plan where we can pool our resources and create bargaining power so the big insurance companies don't have a corner on the market. I mean, the cards are stacked against us right now. And I think this is absolutely the time we need this reform this year. Well, thanks for coming on our website. That's how we, we met you, was you came on the website and gave us some of your story. All it's right, helpful to you. hear. Yeah, it's an honor helpful to, to hear. hear. Um, Paula, you're from nearby, and I met you at the Chamber of Commerce last week. So can you give your perspective? What a great memory you have. <laughs> I figure you may meet a couple of people a week, huh? Um, we have a totally different perspective than you, Jody. Um, and I guess our perspective is that the system is not working as well as it should be, for sure, but does not need to be destroyed in, other, in, a, in order to fix it. So um, I think one of the things that our group comes up with that I think shocks a lot of people is that we happen to think the U.S. healthcare system is an amazing system. It's our number one industry, and we should be helping that industry rather than sort of looking at it like it's bad somehow, because all the money in our healthcare system goes to Americans, all those healthcare workers, that's dollars staying at home. Um, we think that small business gets hit with a double whammy. Uh, one whammy is the cost shifting that takes place in the market. Um, if you look at a service and you say, okay, that service costs the, the doctor $100 to do, and everybody who's covered by Medicare pays $55 for that service, and maybe folks pay, who are covered by Medicaid pay $0.45 cents for that, $45 for that service, and then the uninsured, probably only with catastrophic care, pay zero for that service. Um, you, you know that the medical system has to find that $40 that's out there that wasn't covered. So then you turn to large business, governmental entities, and small business, and you say, okay, you have to pick up that additional cost because Medicare is really not paying the true cost of that coverage. And what happens next is big business and governmental entities are pretty good at negotiating, and that leaves small business picking up this enormous cost shift. Um, so that's the 40% that Jody was talking about. Her it, premiums go up exactly. in part because of that. Her yeah. little business is picking up that cost that other entities, and particularly Medicare would be the big gorilla, I would think, is not picking up. The second problem we have is that private insurance plans, when they look at a business like yours, God forbid one of your people is sick. Let's make it even more egregious. Let's say you've got 20 people and one of those people is really sick. Well, the insurance industry is going to say, well, we're going to, you know, we don't like the risk we're dealing with in that small pool, and we don't like, we're going to experience rate you. And so because of that, we're going to charge you more. And even if everyone's healthy in your business, you're still such a little pool that any, any, any business would say, this is just higher risk than covering, um, you know, a great big company. Well, uh, Senator Kerry, if you go all the way back to the time he was running for president, had come up with this idea of larger risk pools. And that idea is actually, in my opinion, one of the major answers for small business. It doesn't require you to go to a public plan, which I think, I mean, I think, I don't want to argue it, but I think some people could say that Medicare being funded at the levels that it's being funded at is actually destroying the private insurance system right now. Um, but if you switch to another public plan, I think you have the potential to just kill this amazing healthcare system we have. I think we need to change the rules so that small business we're able to go into big risk pools, so we're treated the same way as a larger business, and we would actually advocate some kind of federal health care reserve board or something that would mm -hmm. set rules uh, for the private insurance companies, and it might be that one rule is you can't charge more than 100% of the lowest premium you're charging in your whole region. Um, I, mean, it's, I mean, that's an idea. Um, and it might also say, okay, every private insurance company out there, you're going to have to pick up a catastrophic cost to X dollars. But over that, the government's going to fund the special pool for the hugely catastrophic um, kinds of problems. And so we think there's ways of fixing the system without 
making a leap into the public health care plan, which could have the potential to really hurt the system. And Paula, tell me again, you're, how many small businesses do you have in your organization? Um, we have about 20,000 members. Great, great. Um, has anyone else here had uh, experience like the one that Jody was talking about, or actually Paula referenced, where you had someone in your bit in your employment get sick and then that caused your rates to go up? Is that an experience anybody's had? Chris? We've had a situation uh, close to that in that we had uh, a couple of employees have some significant health issues last year and it diminished our ability to consider other options. Uh, looking to shop the plan, suddenly we had a group that wasn't very marketable. Hmm. And we had to basically stay where we were and take the percentage increase that they gave us. So it, it definitely hampers our ability to uh, negotiate even from a, a, a diminished standpoint of negotiation. So we did have that. And it's certainly uh, something to consider going forward. What we're seeing in our company now, we've reduced staff by about a third. So our small group is getting smaller. As the cost of our premiums go up, uh, some of our employees have taken, well, most of our employees have taken pay cuts. We would expect them to evaluate their insurance needs. The younger and healthier ones mm -hmm. are probably going to start backing out. I don't need this. I'll go to the dock in the box when I need an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. And then what we're going to be left with in our small pool is the older group, the ones that have to have insurance, these folks that I just mentioned that uh, have some significant health needs. So we're back to where we were when we started with a smaller group not very attractive to an insurance provider. So you were up to, you had 50 employees, I think you 52, mentioned at one point. yes ma'am. Uh -huh. And now you're down to what? Down to 33. And uh, indefinitely, because of that situation, uh, we're uh, very excited about seeing something done right away. We think that uh, the health care situation is definitely going to affect us. As we started making these decisions to cut employees, that came up in our conversations a lot. We have the pay and we have the benefits we're providing, and we can save that by reducing staff. And as things turn around, we're going to be looking at the additional cost of providing the benefits because we believe, like Jody, we want to provide health insurance. We feel like that's something that folks need. Uh, we've been in business, as Becky said, for 20 years. We're like a family. We've worked with these folks. Mm -hmm. We've helped raise their children. And to suddenly pull that benefit off the table and say, we're just not going to do it anymore is just not morally for us the correct thing to do. When the company started, we wanted, as Jody said, we wanted a place where people wanted to be. In a small business, that's what you have to have. They're, they're your lifeblood, uh, those workers that come in every day and work shoulder to shoulder with you. And uh, to, to not provide that benefit really is not very attractive to us at all, but it, it is very difficult at this point to do it. Todd? I, I would add that was, I think part of what you're hearing is that because of the way the insurance market works in the small group market for small companies, and especially the smallest companies, um, uh, you, you see enormous swings in premium for these small companies because it's based upon what's happening in their business. Um, for instance, we're, we're, while we may be a nonprofit association, we're also a small business that provides insurance for employees. So I see, I see this uh, on that side as well. And you know, even if someone is not ill, if you have, if say you have a staff of eight people and someone who's 25 leaves and, someone, and you hire someone who's 50 to come in, the average age of your workforce has gone through the roof which all by itself causes your premiums to escalate beyond the cost of the coverage itself. Um, so, uh, so you have to think so, twice about hiring someone right. who's even older. If, That's even if nobody's sick. So there is right, this right. thing where you have always have in the back of your mind as a small business person, you know, you know how are the people who are working for me, uh, they're, you know, the people who are their family members if you provide family coverage? Um, so we've got to get to a point where we're closer to true community rating, where the insurance companies don't have the ability to, um, to underwrite and to rate people closely based upon age and illness. Um, and of course, that means we've got to get everybody in the system because we right. can't expect right. insurance companies to do that otherwise. So uh, that's essentially why we're for a universal coverage system. Um, and 
So, I mean, we see it in the association world, we see it in small businesses all the time. When you really look at the average premium increase of small companies overall, it's only a little bit higher than for big business. But big business has the advantage, if you can call it that, of seeing a fairly steady 10, 12, 14% rate increase year after year, where small business sees 7%, 38%. It's totally unpredictable, and that also means that a new business who's starting up is going to say, I'm not sure if I can continue to afford insurance, so maybe it's better off if I can find a way not to offer it to start with, because it's a whole lot easier to find people who maybe have some other access to coverage to come work for you than to tell people after a year or two, guess what, I can't afford this anymore. So it, it does create this dynamic that really undermines the employer-based healthcare system. It's not really what you want entrepreneurs to be thinking about. No, not at all. <laughs> with how they're going to do that. Uh, Louise? Um, I work in an, in an industry, the hemophilia home care industry, that, is, that works with catastrophic health care costs. Um, the average cost to treat the disease is about 300000 a year. If you have complications of an inhibitor, it can go up to in the millions per year. So it's just a catastrophic, unbelievable cost. Because I work for a company that provides service to those people, there are also some persons with hemophilia who work with my company. And because of that, uh, we have this very, a fairly small pool and these very high risk people in it. And so that makes the health care premiums just go through the roof. And even though I'm relatively healthy, even though I am over 50, um, I, you know, my cost is about. 20, for my employer is about $2,100 a month to cover my family. That's a pretty high insurance premium. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's doable for me, but it, it, is, it is expensive. Um, so the, the whole issue of the people with catastrophic costs, the reason that I think we need a public plan option is, and, and I agree with what you said, is that way we can have a larger pool of people and those persons with these catastrophic costs can, you know, it can even out and they're not going, what, what often happens with persons in that community that work for a small business, and I see this, I see the small business owner side of it, but they find themselves out of a job. Now, I know that's not legal. It's not moral, and, you know, good people wouldn't do that, but, but sometimes for the survival of the business, you know, they find a way to get rid of uh, that person with those catastrophic costs. So discrimination in the marketplace as far as holding on to jobs with employers is just rampant in, in that community. So that's a whole nother issue, but it is. And, but and it Paula pointed out earlier, it's a little, it's probably a little bit short sighted. I mean, this is, this isn't the kind of system we should have, but when that happens, those people who lost their job are still going to get sick and end up in the emergency room, mm -hmm. and somebody has to pay that, and guess who that is? We all pay it. Right, because, We're all because the cost, cost has shifted, correct? Right, right. Mm -hmm. Jane? I have a very small company, and I got health insurance because I believe it's the moral thing to do. Um, I have an employee who needs $1,500 worth of prescription meds every month, and she can't pay that. You know, and so we got health insurance, and we're paying through the nose for it. But it's the only way she's going to make it. And you can't just say, okay, I got to reduce the benefit, so we're going to go with this cheaper plan that's not going to cover everything for you, you know, and put it on her. And she has to have those meds. It's not like, oh, I just want to take these pills. Mm -hmm. She has to have them to function. And it's not fair that because I opened in DC, I have to pay X amount, when if I opened in, in Maryland, they have different laws and it would have been less. You know, it varies from state to state and it definitely varies by who you have working for you. I have five people, you know, out of them, I'm the healthiest, you know, and so I may have reduced our rate a little bit, but I'm not exactly a spring chicken and they're probably <laughs> looking at me like, oh yeah, sure, you're not, you're not unhealthy now, but give you a year, you know, I had an employee go into the hospital just after getting the insurance. Thank God she had it. Next year, my insurance is probably going to double because of it. And I don't know how I'm going to pay for that. I can't hire another person because I'm already paying a salary and health insurance premiums. 
So yeah, I could use another person. I could give somebody a job. I could give somebody a great job, but I can't afford it because I'm already paying it. Mm -hmm. So David, do you have a comment from the perspective of the Hispanic Chamber? Obviously, we all share in the same concerns. Uh, in many cases, in the small group and non-group insurance markets, we're a captured audience. Um, there's, a, whether it, adverse selection, the administrative costs that just simply drive at this balance in the pricing and the rate of premium growth for small businesses, and especially for the self-employed also. Um, anybody that's bought in the non-group market lately will, will I, I haven't met anybody that has a good story to say. Uh, but, um, I've met, but, I'll tell one after this. I've met one person, <laughs> I wanna ask that question about that, but I, I hear you. Um, so and somebody, somebody earlier mentioned risk shifting, for instance, is one of the mm -hmm. things that we, everybody's been working on. I know a lot of our members that, that provide care have been moving towards HDHP, HSA type uh, deals, a, trying to lower the cost. But there's, there's only so far you can use that to lower the costs. At some point, you have to talk about what can you do to take care of those inefficiencies uh, that drive up the costs in the non-group and small group markets. And that's why we think that pooling is a great idea. And uh, we, we, th we very much like the idea of pooling. Pooling, unfortunately, at the state level hasn't worked out very well. And those states have tried to toy with it. Uh, but we think that uh, it, driving ESI, employed sponsored insurance, is very important because we have a lot of small businesses that want to compete. They want to attract and they want to retain employees. And a public option, voluntary public option, which we're not closed to, uh, would not necessarily enhance the opportunities of small business uh, owners to be able to compete with large businesses in providing good benefits to the workers. And that's the, and then there's the, we wear the Hispanic hat, other than being the business, um, they are the largest demographic uh, of the uninsured in this country are Hispanics, and over a quarter of those Hispanics are children. Uh, we very much appreciate the president's leadership on including IKEA and the S SHIP bill and helping push that through Congress, and we very much appreciate that because that will take care of a lot of uninsured children, uh, the non citizen children. And that's, I guess, where we also caution that when we talk about public options, we know the welfare reform bill uh, restricts immigrant eligibility, non-citizen eligibility, and we're not talking here about undocumented immigrants. We're talking about, you know, green card holders that have lived in this country almost their entire lives. And we want to make sure that public, uh, that ESI becomes the main driver because that allows not only competition and businesses to thrive, but it also ensures that uh, protection against non-citizens who may face nativist restrictions and eligibility as we've seen in a lot of federal programs. You're using the term ESI, and I want to be sure we all... Employer-sponsored employer insurance. Employer-sponsored insurance. So the, president, the president's plan does build on the current employer-based system, and so I think we're, we're talking about the same thing. You said you hadn't heard any good stories. I wanted to mention one that I'd heard because I want to see if anyone else here has, uh, has done this, but when I was in North Carolina with uh, uh, Governor Perdue, I met a small business um, owner in the textile business, and she was talking about facing, sort of like you, Jody, 40% increases, and really they were faced with having to give up their insurance. And she said they decided to fight, and what they did was uh, they in instituted wellness and prevention programs that were pretty aggressive, where people um, needed to walk and do various things to reduce their premiums. And she said they were able to hold it flat for a year by doing that. Now, that's a, it's a year-to-year -year proposition. It's not a, not a silver bullet, but they were able to do that. I just wondered if anyone else here has any experience with, in your market with those kind of plans being available where you can lower your costs. Is anyone? Yeah, Brian? Well, in um, Howard County, they've come out with, they've got a Healthy Howard program, and they've just sort of beta testing a program where the employers will be able to have a gold, silver, or bronze certification for healthiness. Now, yesterday morning, just by coincidence, I met with the broke insurance broker, and 
he were, he's in the Chamber of Commerce. He hadn't heard about this program, but they're going to be sponsoring it, evidently. But the, um, one of the things he talked to me about was what we're going to do this year. Now, I don't know what my new rates are until August, uh, well, 40 to four, five days before August. So he, said, he was warning me that they could go up 17 to 20%. Well, last year, to counteract, just like you say, holding it back, just like mm -hmm. these people Hold held it, it back with a health For a year, yeah. He suggested we go with these HSA savings accounts. The health, health savings accounts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we had, with the HMO is a 1500 deductible and a 4000 on the PPO, if you chose that option. Um, that, that just made just a nightmare in paperwork. Uh, it just, it seems like every time you just go and get a drug, you get three pieces of paper. Um, they have a website, and it's got a one-line item, but then but the, all the stuff comes in the mail, then it tells you what they're going to cover, what they're not going to cover. And then, of course, finding out what actually goes towards your deductible is confusing as well. And I took in the folder to show him. It was this deep, and bear in mind, we're only seven months into this new plan. You know, and it, this folder was for you or for your... It was, my, it was my, just uh, my wife and I. For your personal file. Yeah, just my personal file. Now, luckily, we've got younger people in there, um, that don't use it as much, and so we're going to do a little survey and see just how much they use it. And, but it's very difficult. But then the other thing is, he said, well, we're going to need to do a survey of your employees and see how we are. So I said, oh, okay. He says, have any old people, older people left? And I said, well, yeah, yeah, one person did. They've moved on to a different job. He said, oh, that's good. I mean, this is because <laughs> this is going to bring it down. But, you know, he's offering, you know, but, but, well, what do we do this year? What do we do this year to, to keep the premiums down? I, I, I don't know. I, I'm just wondering. He says, well, maybe one of the other companies is going to be helping us by being, coming into the market and being more competitive, and maybe that bring it down. I, I, you know, I just wonder what the next thing I've got to do. Now, the healthy had one is a good idea. I mean, here we got, you know, let's, maybe the insurance company will embrace that and say, this is a great thing to do. We'll drop your rates. But that's only going to be one time. Right. It's not good. And, unless, of course, if we go to gold and we go to, you know, if we work our way up, maybe they're going to offer us really big discounts for having healthy uh, employees. And remind me how many employees you have. We have 20 and uh, 12, 12 are on the health care. Now, the, now, just to bear in mind, I employ auto technicians that have quite high salaries. So just because one person we provide health care for, you still got to compensate the money for that other person because it's so much money that giving someone health care is works out so many dollars an hour more. So you can't have a preference. So what we did a few years ago in another effort to bring down our costs was we let people opt out for a certain price and they opted out and picked their um, spouse's plan or mm -hmm. some other or firefighter's plan or whatever it was. But we're still paying that money in the form of extra wages. Nancy, and we have a completely different, um, we're sort of a success story on the wellness plan. Oh, good. Um, and we worked with a company that I think it started out in South Africa, and they've really got their act together on wellness. Um, and they offer points and for doing certain things like preventive care or if you run in a marathon. And um, the more points you get, you can actually get stuff like sports things and TVs. And I'm amazed around the office listening to the kind of dialogue going on in the hallway, you know, so-and-so just got a TV and he just ran the marathon, are you doing the marathon? And now we have groups of our employees running marathons and um, I would never have believed it except I realized that even myself, I was looking at how many points I had and figuring out, gee, if I just read this thing on such and such, I'll pick up two more points, and that's <laughs> all I need. And I thought, there's something to this. It motivates so, people. Yeah, yeah. It, it really, so I think the, um, I think there's a lot to these wellness programs, and in fact, we were able to keep our, um, our premiums down quite a bit, and I attribute it to the wellness because they were giving us credit for so many of our employees actively participating in this program. Well, that's got to be part of comprehensive health reform, I think, some kind of focus on prevention and wellness, mm -hmm. whatever we do going forward. Um, Melissa, you or Michelle, you had your hand up, I think, or, oh, Jamie? Hi. Um, I wanted to um, discuss how everyone's talking about low-risk, high-risk employees, although I am um, representing small business owners. I myself am an employee, and I'm considered the low-risk because I'm in my 20-sums. Um, but I do have to let you know that a lot of uh, the 20-sums um, have 
sexually transmitted diseases that are rampant at this mm -hmm. point. And because there's this assumption that 20 sums are low risk, you know, our employers don't feel that they need to cover our health insurance. Um, and, and it's a big thing that's going on with, with people who have, grad, who have recently graduated. And this new workforce, they're not going in for their annuals. You know, the men and women, you know, they don't know that they have these diseases and it's just, you know, it, it's being passed on from one partner to the next. Um, so we have to not create these silos of low risk, high risk. I think everyone from a human standpoint and, and a moral standpoint should have health insurance, no matter what age you are. So I just wanted to throw that out there. No, that's helpful. Terry? Yeah, I also wanted to um, speak up in the voice of the self-employed. I myself started a business when I was 18 as a commercial fisherman. Mm -hmm. So every time you go to a restaurant and have seafood, remember a self-employed American caught that fish, or maybe somebody overseas. But also, when you go to the grocery store, you got to remember all that food you're buying. 85% of our farmers, nearly 2 million farmers, are self employed. And That's you know, an then important you can, you can go on and to realtors, a lot of the realtors, yeah, there's a big right. name there, but most of them are working on a commission or self employed. And where do they go? They have to go to the individual market. So if we all think it's bad out there in the small group market where we've all had companies, it's only worse in the individual market where you have to go. And we have 21 million Americans that are self-employed. It's a big percentage of our total workforce. So they're part of this small business population. And their story is a little bit different and a little bit more magnified. But I think we got to, as we design health care reform, we got to make it work for all the small businesses, including the 21 million self-employed, the 80% of small businesses, there's nearly 5 million that are under 10 employees, and, and then on up. It's a real diverse uh, group of companies that we've all got to try and make sure they're included and it works for. Well, and I think we almost run the gamut here because I know we have some, well, Jane's five and Jody, you have 50 or so, right, 55, and, and the links do as well. But since you brought up the individual and the, the self-employed, talk to us for a second about what do you think is needed in comprehensive health reform for that group? Well, I, I think you've got to echo what everybody says here about cost. It's got to be affordable for the employer and the employee if the employee is going to pay 25 percent <laughs> or whatever your policy is. And a lot of people, the reality is we have a lot of low-wage employees as part of our company or in some companies in retail, that's why we see such a low offer rate in, in retailers. They have a massive amounts of lower wage employees. That's part of the reality of our economy. So it has to be affordable for employee and employee. And I think uh, small businesses want more choices. A lot of times you don't, in reality, they tell you, oh, there's this many companies offering insurance. But when you, as an individual company, get down to how many offers do you have? And some of them are really outrageous. And you realize there's nobody actually competing for my, my business. <laughs> yeah. So when we say choice, it's not like a theoretical choice, but there's actually competitive bids like the gas stations. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're pretty tightly. You can see there's competition. It's not one's not double the other. Um, and, and, and ultimately, um, the cost shifting, you know, we're not going to get to where we want if everybody's not covered. So there can't be a small business solution ultimately and stop all this expensive cost shifting if we don't have um, everyone covered, I think. And that's why you know, we advocate it's got to be comprehensive, that you can't just take on one piece, the cost piece, or the, uh, you know, have more offerings. So it's got to go together and be comprehensive. Tell me a little bit more about your group, by the way, the small business majority. How long has it been around? And we're, we're a new group, and uh, we're an advocacy group. We're not a membership group. Mm -hmm. We've done a lot of uh, public opinion polls, two national polls, eight state polls of all the universe of small businesses um, out there to gauge what kinds of alternatives they would support. And I think the major finding out there is that small businesses are real bottom line orient. They want a solution. That's what they really want. They're expecting the leadership that is elected as the presidency and the Congress to figure it out, do something that provides them affordable options that they can. And they're pretty flexible on what it is. They're, they want a solution more than they want to hear a battle about the ideology of, of what the solutions are. Thanks. Mark, um, Terry made a comment about, you know, some people work for big companies. and. 
you, your, your company, are you a franchiser, franchisee? No, no, no. Okay. And, and it's a, it's is it moving in storage, is moving, that what you said? Moving storage, part of United Van Lines, but it's not franchised. Great. And how many employees do you have? I have about 30. So uh, how long have you been around and what's been your experience Well, it's, here? we've been around for a long time. It's a family business. My dad started in 1956 and we always had health insurance and it used to be just a very small expense and now it's a very large expense. Um, I, I think what we had to do recently is, uh, and which I'm finding to be the norm in the business community I belong to with you know, CEOs, is, is just strip the benefits away and just leave it to individual plans. Because you can pay $3,000 for an individual plan or $12,000 for a family. You cannot ask employees to pay anything more. And you know, in this economy, businesses are really thinking in a survival mode. And, uh, so, and there's so much uncertainty. Uh, so, um, and so that's, that's where I've seen. But, uh, so you no longer cover the, the, the families family, of no. your employees? I, I grandfathered in the existing employees, so I won't offer it further. To and new I, ones? I, yeah, to new ones. Um, I think the other point, uh, if you wouldn't, if I'd like to make, uh, um, is I think it was already brought up, is the hidden costs and the premiums, uh, the all-payer type system where, you know, the uninsured go into a hospital and, um, the, premium, uh, the, the cost is passed on to the insurance company, which goes on to the premiums, to, to the ones that provide it. So, you know, it's the small businesses holding the bag, and the bag's getting heavier and heavier because, you know, more companies are dropping it. So it's this vicious cycle that, you know, it's just ready, you know, this bag is ready to burst. But, uh, uh, but, but um, that's, you know, so therefore what I advocate to a large degree is the sure responsibility that, you know, companies, you know, somehow, some way, all participate in healthcare. Uh, and I'm so glad to hear when I did walk in that the in your introductory that uh, um, that, uh, that that you're very sensitive and you understand the urgency. So I really appreciate your staff and the administration. <laughs> I thought there'd be a bit of a persuasion factor here, and there wasn't. So <laughs> well, I hope you'll <laughs> so be that persuaded. Was a but no, we we want to hear your stories, and yeah. we we're glad that you could be here. Sure. Yeah, Becky. I'd like to speak to the expense side of, uh, of health care. As he was saying, um, health care coverage is the top, uh, is the number three expense on our financials. So what, um, give me one, two, and then you told us it's uh, three. Well, we have um, our um, payroll and then mm -hmm. our rent, our leases, and then our health care insurance. Um, so same so um, our employees pay 15% yeah. Of their individual premiums, but they pay 100% of their spouse, children, or family coverage. But what was interesting when I was preparing the budget for this fiscal year, and uh, it got to the bottom line, the number, the loss that was there was identical to the number that the expense of health care was going to be for that year. So I could have said, you know, no health care, and we would have, we could have a break-even budget. But we had to look at other things. We had to lay off some people. We had to uh, cut everybody's salaries. We did away with our 401k match. We did away with any other employee recognition programs. So, you know, it changed the culture of our company quite a bit. A lot of the employee benefit side of it mm -hmm. because of a lot of the cuts that we had to make. And as Chris said, with uh, being in business for 20 years and a lot of the people who work for us have been with us a long time, um, the effect, I think the emotional effect it had on them to see their coworkers leaving and everybody getting pay cuts, it's been tough. Is that the first time you've had to do that? Um, we had uh, two after 9-11 yeah. and that slowed down. Mm -hmm. Two people, that. yeah. Mm -hmm. Does it feel like you're going backwards? Yes. Sort of, mm -hmm. I mean, you've built this up and you right. must be very proud, but mm -hmm. yeah. it's a very tough situation. Yeah, Michelle. Um, I just wanted to comment on what Becky and then I saw Jody nodding her head said. And you know, your number one cost is payroll, your number two cost is rent, and then there's your number three cost. And what we found in talking to our small business owners is that is the fastest growing and most unpredictable cost of doing business. You know what your rent's going to be and you know what your payroll's going to be. And I think it kind of keys in on a very big point, and that is that it's the one thing that is completely out of your control and you're at the behest of the insurers. And one of the things that we've advocated for very strongly from an NFIB standpoint is some serious and significant insurance market reform in comprehensive health care. Um, that's something that I think we've worked on for a long time. But now that we're looking at comprehensive, I think this is a true opportunity to take a look at some of the things that we have done for the insurers over the years. You know, they've, they've been very successful in carving out the types of policies that allow them to 
keep a very good profit margin in, and to, in a lot of states because there is such a significant amount of market concentration. There's only a few places you can go and a few carriers you can go to to buy your policies that now there's a significant amount of concentration and we don't have enough competition. And I think by coming up with a national set of rules, which is something that NFIB advocates for, some serious insurance rating rules that goes back and looks at how we get to some of that uniformity and taking health status out of the equation, you can get to some of that premium predictability that I think people are really looking for. We hear it from our small business owners all the time and mm -hmm. every story that we've heard today is very similar to what we hear when we go out on the road and talk to our members. And you know, they're tired of not understanding why they get a 16% increase one year and they get a 36% increase the next year. And the only thing that they know is that somebody had a birthday and nobody got sick and nobody had a NICU baby and they just don't understand what's going on. And so, so it, should just, it could just be the aging of their workforce. It could be the be aging of their workforce. Yeah. And you know, it's like Todd said, if, if you lose a 26-year-old employee and you hire a 52-year-old employee, you've really changed the cosmetic makeup of your workforce. And that has a huge impact on your premium. And so... I think that a big part of this conversation has to be insurance market reform, not only in the small group market, but also in the individual group market, because for our members, about 10% of our members fall into the non-group market and they purchase there. And you know, it's a very, it's the most broken market, but then the rest of our members purchase in small group. And you know, it's broken and there's 50 different sets of rules and there's no uniformity and there isn't a great amount of um, motivation on the part of the insurers to do anything to make it easier because they know that they only have so much that they can negotiate on with the large employers because they're afraid of losing that, that business. You know, it's hard to lose 2,000 employee business. And it's easier to lose 20 if they have to go shop somewhere else. And then you have the non-group. And then the small group market is where a lot of insurers are making the vast majority of their profit. And, you know, we aren't supposed to be insulating them so that they can make a profit. They're supposed to be delivering on quality and value. And so I think we need market reform rules that really suggest that motivation on their part. Can you say more about the market reform rules that you suggest for the small group and individual markets? Well, I think that you do need individual and national, uh, individual and small group market reform rules. And you know, when we think about it at NFIB, we think about it in the context of a connector exchange type setting. So, for instance, for instance, if you're going to have something like a connector exchange, then you should be able to allow. You might, Marie, you might explain that oh. a little bit because people have been talking about pooling, but mm -hmm. this is related. I so think, pooling, if you, explain you know, it. I mean, I think everybody knows this is such an arcane analogy, but it's the one that I find everybody can visualize. So you can buy one soda at a time or you can buy a case of sodas. So you can pay 75 cents or you can pay, you know, 360, just for the sake of math. And um, the idea that if you buy 360, that that's a case or, you know, 24 employees coming together with their, em 24 employers with their employees coming together they get a much better deal. There's a lot more people, there's a better ability to spread risk, and you have better bargaining power, and all of those things in our mind lead to more competition. So in a connector exchange type approach, what you're doing is you're allowing individuals who currently buy outside in the non-group market and small employers who buy in the fully insured market, which is the state by state by state products that you all buy unless, you know, you guys are suddenly self-insuring or something. Um, and it gives you the ability to go in there and get a better price. And in our mind, in a connector exchange, you would have a set of market rules that provide some set of consistency. Right now, if you want to offer a plan in Wisconsin, you follow one set of requirements. If you want to offer a plan in Arizona, you follow a different set of requirements. And I'm only going to guess that in Tennessee, maybe you have somebody that's you know, from Kentucky or maybe somebody who works someplace else, and you have to really go to a huge effort in order to be able to find a plan that works in both states. Right. We actually have um, employees in six different states. We oh, have wow. three offices, but we also have sales reps, uh, you know, out in the field in other states, so we have to consider many different states. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in our mind, we just think that having those national market reform rules, whether it's, you know, taking health status out of the equation. Um, so no pre-existing No pre-existing condition conditions. conditions. Because especially for our members, you know, we tend to be, our members tend to be older. They mm -hmm. tend to come into owning a, a business independently, a small <coughs> business, after they've had another career. And so um, we do think that taking age and health... Well, you have to be able to rate appropriately and, and give appropriate faction to age, but at the same time, you cannot exclude people simply because they've gotten sick. And so I think those kinds of things and taking geography and other factors into, into account, I think one of the other things you have to be able to do for small businesses is, is really look at how they rate small businesses from an insurer perspective versus how they rate larger businesses. And it's really easy to go into the class of business and start dicing up and dissecting so that you can apply a certain segment of the premium increase to them. And I think that we've got to get away from that practice because I think it's abusive and especially bad for small businesses and non-group. 
We need you negotiating mm -hmm. for us. Bill, did you have a comment? It, well, I wanted to raise an aspect that hasn't been talked about much here, and that's those small businesses that don't provide any insurance at all. Uh, we have uh, a, a, a number of our members. I, I'm pleased to see you quoting our, uh, our report in, in, in your uh, analysis this morning. Um, we have many who, who simply are unable to provide insurance at all or provide insurance to a very small part of their, uh, uh, of their employee base. Uh, it, it's very difficult for us when we look at the numbers, uh, the, 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 the profitability of the business, their ability to pay, their, uh, their ability uh, of their employees to pay. It's very difficult for us to see how we can get to universal coverage without a very strong intervention by the government. <coughs> We need help. Uh, the, the, our members, uh, as you saw when you looked at this report, believe that the government can and should be participating in helping and really support a, a public option that drives the kind of competition that's needed that, as you just <coughs> described. Uh, so I, I, I hope when you, when you look at this, we, we don't get into just an ideological debate about this. This is not an ideological question. It's a practical question. It's how can we get there from here? And unless we have that kind of intervention in, in this uh, uh, circumstance, it's difficult to conceive of how we can actually get uh, from where we are now to universal coverage and to take care of these people. Which, uh, your organization, which states are, are you, uh, do you have members from? Uh, we're, we're in 16. I, uh, they're uh, they're uh, listed back uh, all through here. We're in, uh, uh, I can just, Colorado, Idaho, Illinois, uh, Iowa, Maine, Montana, New Hampshire. New Jersey, New York, Oregon, Rhode Island, and Washington State. So in all those places you have uh, small businesses who are members who are just not providing at all. They can't Well, do it. some of them do and some of them don't. Right. Uh, uh, Jody is, uh, in fact, a member oh, uh, of, uh, of our organization, as the, the doctor in, in New Jersey. Uh, so some do and some don't. Um, um, Many of them, I'm most familiar with Washington, where I'm from. We have about 1,000 people affiliated with uh, the organization there. A lot of them, uh, uh, about half of them, do in fact have insurance. The other half don't. But they, but they'd like to. They join with us in trying to advocate for change that would bring it about. Got it. And um, you talked about Dr. Benelli, so I'd like to recognize her for a second. Yes. With um, my organization in, in New Jersey, um, my corporation is called Dental Choice PC, and we have seven employees. Um, and I've found over the years since I've started, we've been in existence now for nine years. And over the years, I've found that the policies that I've been able to negotiate um, have been where the premiums have been higher in my earlier years in the organization. And, um, and my employees weren't able to afford the higher monthly rates. And I had one employee in particular um, within the past year they had to have major surgery and she did not have insurance and it was unfortunate and in the bed in the hospital I spoke to her and she says Dr. Benelli promise me that you're going to do something that we can all have dental insurance that we all can afford it and that really touched my heart when she said that to me laying in a hospital bed without dental insurance at the time having major surgery and um, and I said to her I will really try and I pulled the different staff members to find out what they really could afford on a monthly basis. And we, my administrator and I, we started the trek of trying to find a plan that they can afford. And um, we found one that we were able, they could afford on the monthly premiums, but the deductible is now somewhere from 2,500 to 4,500. So they're all believing God that they never have to have major medical um, use of the plan because they don't know how they're gonna afford the deductible, although they can use the preventative side of the plan um, because of the low premium. So that's one of the things that um, I've really had to deal with. And over the years, most of my employees have been single moms um, because I haven't been able to attract, um, well, I would say single moms that I've, I've had to train um, in the workplace and um, bring them under my wing and, and teach them the fundamentals of um, dental science. And, um, and I've found that the more, um, the, the older, um, population that have been in the profession to recruit a staff like that where I did not have to train where they came with the expertise, I would have to offer them um, a full benefits package because that's what they needed to come on board and I was not able to do that um, over the years because of the cost. Um, so that pretty much is, is my story in New Jersey and I, I really am looking forward to the, the public 
um, health option um, insurance coverage because I find that it will be, hope, I'm hoping that it's going to give us a more diverse ability for everyone to be able to, to participate um, where they're able to fully utilize all aspects of the plan if they need to and there's a piece because I think my really I've, I've offered my employees a false sense of security that they have something that they can use but in essence they can use part of it and they're scared to use the, the other parts of it if they have to have have to use it and and that's unfortunate at this time but that's what is available to us in the state of New Jersey and um, and it's it's really it's terrible though so they're scared to use it yes <laughs> that's not, where we are right now yeah Val you were not in yeah, I was, uh, you have a printing company, yes. is that right? <clears throat> We've been in business for 22 years, um, and we have to offer uh, insurance because these are the people who help us, uh, our success story. Um, and at the same time, um, how can you keep your skilled employees if you strip them of coverage? And how can you attract new employer uh, employees if you plan to grow? Um, those are the questions that we face every day. Uh, you know, um, uh, if we don't have any plan to expand, we got to keep the core of our employees, the people that uh, know what they're doing. And, um, you know, uh, those are the things that we face. So uh, it's hard to say that, you know, a, a small company, I, I will, um, let's just say, uh, cut this and cut that, but not the uh, health coverage because um, that's the reason why these people working for us. Um, they want health insurance. Um, uh, if, if we don't offer health insurance, why should they work for us? A bigger company will um, have a better plan, and uh, you know, if we don't have the skilled worker, we will go out of business. I, I just want to add that. You're in Virginia. Yes, ma'am. So what have you uh, seen in terms of your premiums? Uh, double digits every year. Double digit increases? Increases every year. And uh, the average age of our employees are 45 or older. Um, you know, we have people in their 60. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, it's uh, not much we can do. You know, it's, but, but, you know, these are the people who... Uh, working with us over the year, you know, we, we just like a family, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I will uh, do whatever I can to keep them on board, but uh, I can't wait until, you know, your plan um, go into uh, effect, you know, hopefully. <laughs> Michelle's we, plan, well, I, exactly. You have, you have one vote Dan right will be here. a little alarmed when he yeah. hears the, yeah. the NFIB plan, yes. but no, I mean, I think she, um, I'm teasing Michelle because she's very articulate about the insurance market reforms yeah. that need to happen in Virginia and all over the whole country. It just, I'm struck in hearing you bow, it just sounds like you don't feel that you have any leverage here. No ma'am, uh, we only have six employees, uh, full-time employees. Um, some have uh, high, you know, claims or experience. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have any leverage to negotiate the rates with our current uh, carrier or with other carriers, because nobody wants to take us. Um, you know, a bunch of uh, people in their 50, um, you know, it's just higher risk. You know, you got, pen you got penalized when you get older. Um, you know, whether you are healthy or not, it's just statistics that, you know, once you pass 50, uh, there's more uh, potential uh, health problems. What do you do to try to deal with the increasing cost? And you said you cut back in other areas, but where, where can you go? I mean, your rent? Not I don't much, know. not much. Um, well, um, if it keeps us up, you know, we will cut back the work hours. Um, I will volunteer to take a pay cut uh, or have to lay off some people, which uh, we don't want to do. All right. Louise? I just wanted to add a word about the expense, the, the premium expense, just my experience and the reason that um, I'm not a small business owner today, but working for an employer is uh, last year, I, like I said, I've, I've worked in this industry for more than 20 years, but last year I had an opportunity to set it up as my own business with a partner. And when we sought out health insurance and worked with a broker, the quote that we received from a major carrier 
uh, was $13,000 a month. That was the premium cost. And that was to cover two employees and our families. So it was family coverage for two employees. When I got that quote, I just thought to myself, this shouldn't be legal. They shouldn't even be allowed to offer that kind of a quote. It's the same as a denial, but it's not really a denial. <laughs> so you can't become an uninsurable and get into any kind of program for, you know, for someone who is an uninsurable if you have those options in your state, you know, a high risk pool right, or something. Right. You can't go there because it wasn't a denial. But yet those kind of costs are just astronomical and there was no way that we could we could do this business because we had to have health care for ourselves and our families. My my husband is self employed, so I've always carried our health care through all of our thirty years of marriage through my employer. And um, and the same with, with my partner. So um, so we ended up just having to go back to the blackboard and became actually were able to continue in business but became employees of a larger company and you know and are working um, in that way so so our dream of being able to have our own small business really was not possible because of health care costs Chris and then I want to get Kate in here just to follow up on that and what uh, Terry and Bill said a few minutes ago, we don't know a whole lot about the individual policy side, but we're about to find out if something isn't done because that's where the small businesses are headed. We're not going to be able to carry it. Our folks are going to be left with that alternative and owners of the company are going to have to go out and seek their own insurance. And I'm afraid our story is going to end up looking a lot like Louise's if we're not careful. The other thing that I wanted to mention, I've heard a few folks talk about HSAs. And while we're focused pretty much on the premium side, there's another dimension to it. We tried that option a couple of a years ago as an alternative to have a smaller percentage increase. We went to the high deductible plan. We made our deductibles the same. We set up the other part of the deductible paid by the company for an HSA. We thought, okay, now we've got something. Then our folks went out and started using it. And we went through that money very quickly. We were, uh, here, theretofore, we were using uh, co-pays, but when we had to start going and buying those services, going to the doctor's office, we were told they were discounted rates, but we had some sticker shock. And then folks started going to the pharmacy, and we started ripping through that money, and that was not an option for us. So cost containment on that side, buying the drugs they need, buying the services they need, even when they had their own account to do it. It didn't take very long until we depleted those, and we got away from that option. It was, uh, it was a, a bureaucratic situation too. Folks never really understood quite how to make it work. There was a lot of continuing education that needed to be done. Uh, folks did not defer in the money that we hoped they would to mm -hmm. keep the account balances up. Uh, young folks took it as free and gave themselves a raise, that's what I would have done probably, mm -hmm. but uh, it just didn't work and, and that was a, a serious problem for us. One other comment I'd like to make uh, in closing too on this, we are, are delighted to be here and to tell our story and we've been brought out into this debate. Uh, a Frida player from the Service Employees Union first contacted us and we attended a, a group of small business uh, owners in Nashville and started sharing these stories. And it was really uh, encouraging. Uh, it, it wasn't a lot of good news, but to know we had folks out there who were facing the same problems and trying to come up with solutions. And Lori Smith at the Tennessee Healthcare Campaign, she continued on. So I really appreciate the attention that we're getting. And I know a lot of the folks that are working with small businesses now are, are sort of coming to our rescue. I feel that we're being heard. We've got to have some help. And, and now's the time because with the economic situation that we're in, the problem that we had two years ago is three or four times as bad. Yeah, that's the sad thing. I want to introduce my colleague, Larry Summers, who's head of uh, the President's National Economic Council. Um, Larry, I really appreciate your coming. And he has been spending a lot of time working with our team here at the White House who are looking to try to move forward on health care this year for the President. And of course, has a has a special expertise in looking at our economic situation and how healthcare is making that worse, and how we need to do comprehensive health reform to make it better. Larry, do you want to say something, and then we'll continue to hear these stories? I need to 
press the yeah. I suspect I know less about what's happening on the ground than anyone else in this room, but I'll say a thing or two from an aggregate point of view. I think we as a country can do much, much better than we are. 100,000 Americans die each year due to medical errors. Hypertension is something that's completely soluble. There was a study done at Harvard while I was there that found that of all the hypertension in the United States, only one in four cases was being properly controlled. And that down, that, down the road, that meant um, strokes, which would cause children not to know their grandparents. It meant emergency room visits. And it meant incredibly expensive rehabilitation medicine. And that you could tell similar stories with respect to diabetes and a number of other conditions. It can't be right that the richest and best and most powerful and most innovative and most flexible economy in the world has infant mortality and health statistics where we're duking it out with Costa Rica to be in the world top 30. It just can't be right. And at the same time, small business, you all know better than I, but uh, first of all, there's never been a big business that didn't start as a small business. Second of all, if you look at where the jobs come from and where the majority of the job growth in our economy comes from, it's a uh, small business. If you look at where people get their start, it's heavily small business. And frankly, if you look at the economic interactions that touch people's lives, really touch their lives, it's not usually going to Walmart. And it involves a small business. So in a real sense, you're the backbone of the nation's economy. And the system we've had hasn't worked well for you and the people who work with you. Too often it's created situations where people didn't get insurance. Too often it's created situations where taking care of one ill member of a business family existentially threatened a business's able, ability to exist. Too often it's created a situation where you were rendered not competitive by the fact that you felt an obligation to provide health insurance and you couldn't get it in a reasonable uh, way. And that's been mirrored at the national level. You know, you can you have uncontrolled and unsustained growth in health care costs. Maybe it shows up in the fact that businesses have to pay more and they can't compete in the world. And maybe it shows up as the competitiveness. Uh, maybe instead it shows up as lower wages for all the workers because they're able to push it down. And so we don't see incomes of middle class families grow. And my friends in the economics profession find it a fascinating subject to debate which of those two things happen and which of those two things happen over what horizon. But it seems to me that it's really not that interesting a question because both are unacceptable. And that what we need to do is get on with the task of reforming uh, the healthcare system. There's only been uh, one year since in the last, one other year in the last 50. When if you look across the presidential election and you look across the congressional elections, um, there was such a consistent mandate for change in our country. And that suggests to me that this is really the moment to bring about major change in 
the health care system. If you compare this moment to 1993, we've got a lot of things going for us. We've learned the lessons from a set of mistakes that were made in 1993. Healthcare, healthcare as a share of GNP is a quarter higher than it was in 1993. State models that work much better on both the cost and the access side have been developed that weren't present in 1993. A set of constituencies, whether it's private health insurers or other groups who weren't at the table in 1993, are now at uh, the table. And so I think there's a really very good chance of doing this. And I think it's a moral issue for our children. But I also think it's a deeply practical issue at both the microeconomic level in terms of letting businesses survive, uh, businesses like yours, and let's not forget that the largest supplier of General Motors is Blue Cross of Michigan. So it is a business survival issue. And I would also suggest that it's a competitiveness and national economic strength issue. And that's why it's one I'm devoting a lot of my time to as head of the President's National Economic Council. And a crisis like our current broad economic crisis is an opportunity to do something about it. What better way to stimulate demand than by getting us past a world where a grocery store has more, has more information technology than a hospital? What better way to stimulate demand and by creating all kinds of jobs, giving all the people who need preventive care and don't get it the preventive care they require. What better way to create jobs than by ensuring um, that uh, people who need health care can get it in a cost-effective way? So I just am um, really glad to be here. Um, I'm sorry that the... Uh, set of global economic meetings in Washington kept me from being here sooner. And uh, thank you for what you're doing to make our economy stronger. We've, we've heard, Larry, from a number of businesses here who've, who've said in a micro level exactly what you just said. They've laid uh, the links here from Nashville and they've had a business for 20 years and had to lay people off this last year because they couldn't afford the health care increases they were seeing. I mean, pretty much everybody around this table has had a similar story. Kate, I wanted to get you in here for some comments. Um, we've heard from our members all of, the, all of the issues that we've heard around the table already, but one side of the issue um, that we hear about most often is the question of uh, benefits equity. Um, a large percentage of our members employ a large percentage of gay employees. Um, and uh, for those that don't know, um, employers who offer family benefits to their gay employees then have to have those employees' benefits for their families taxed as salary. Um, I was shocked to find out from many of our members when we did a survey a few months ago that um, these employees who are employers who want to give full benefits to all of their employees have either stopped giving employees uh, benefits for their families, so they, they aren't extending that option for all of their employees' families, or they are not giving that option to, <clears throat> excuse me, their LGBT employees who have families. Um, and it's a, it's a real physical pain <laughs> that these employers are dealing with because they can see it is a moral imperative um, that anyone who is employing um, any group of people be able to provide access to health care. Um, and, and all of these employers understand that. Um, but the, the question of either taking that option away from people so that they can be equitable to everyone, or taking more on in the cost of payroll, so kind of making up the, the difference in salary for their LGBT employees, or just you know not giving those options to LGBT employees has been 
a, a huge problem that many of our members are facing. And honestly, probably uh, every person at this table is, it, probably every person at this table who's a small business owner has an LGBT employee and is facing the same issue. Um, you know, the, the LGBT community makes up about 10 to 15 percent of the, of the population. Um, and it's, it's hard to imagine that there's not a small business out there that's not being affected by this that is offering benefits to, uh, to employees' families. So um, it would be great to see, you know, that's, that's kind of more on, on the tax side, but certainly a question of, um, of uh, opportunity to take advantage of health care um, and, and a change that would make an integral difference in the lives of, of many, many employers and, and Americans. Thanks. Paula. There's one topic I thought we'd hear a lot about, and I, we haven't heard it at all as far as I can tell, which is um, deductibility of premiums in companies and the difference between certain small businesses and others. So if you're a C Corp, you're able to have deductible health care premiums, and if you're self-employed, you're not. Um, and I guess there's some movement afoot to just say, well, let's not let anybody deduct health care premiums, and that's the way we can funnel, you know, get some costs into the system that'll help pay for other things. Um, I would suggest that if you took away deductibility of health care premiums in the small business market, you might end up with a whole lot less small business employees covered. I think that's a real incentive for coverage in that market, but I think there should be parity so that whatever kind of small business, whatever kind of entity they're running their business, they all should be able to deduct health care premiums. And just to clarify, I think what Paul's talking about is not income tax deductibility, but, but FICA tax. So people who are self-employed can't deduct their health, health insurance premiums against their self-employment tax. Right. Which, since they pay both sides, is 15.3%. And so we've seen that people can have premiums of more than $20,000 a year individually. So that's a $3,000 tax on self-employment tax that they pay that no other person working, getting into health insurance has to pay. Got it. Yes, Brian. Yeah, and one of the things that's going to come up is the cost of this. And everybody talks about the cost and, oh, we can't afford it. But as we've seen, the cost of doing nothing is far more. Already I see the cost of doing nothing over last year was 17 to 20 percent. So what's it going to be next year? So the, 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 this has to happen. I, I don't see how we're going to manage when if it doesn't. So. Couldn't have said it better, Bill. Dr. Summers and uh, your comments and, and some of the others, uh, back to a question here. I would, I, one of our small businessmen testified to the House Ways and Means Committee the other day, endorsed a public option, and the ideological heat that came into the room was palpable. You know, it's a big room and the temperature went up. Uh, I, I just don't get it. Um, to, to, to us, this is a factual question. This is not an ideological discussion. How can we cut into the GDP if we cannot bring down those costs, uh, or at least cut the, the growth rate of those costs? How can we bring these products to small businesses uh, in a market that has been unable to supply them? Uh, and, and even with the reforms that are discussed, that it will not be able to supply, uh, supply them. So I, I, I'm hoping that we can find a way to, to get the actual, some actual numbers here to really deal with the economy of these small businesses that we work with, uh, the, the facts of the matter that they face, and what really is going to happen when we bring forward a health care reform and try and get away from some of that ideological. Well, that's people. one message I think we've heard loud and clear. This is not for those of you who are small business owners or represent small businesses. This is not ideological. This is making payroll, keeping people working, keeping going. So I hear that loud and clear. David? Um, we're having words coming out of our mouth that we never thought we would say, like universal coverage and voluntary public option. It, it feels very awkward for us to be able <laughs> to talk about this, but, but clearly the state of the non-group and small group insurance markets and the lack of reform of those insurance markets leads us to, uh, to see the sag of productivity and the cost that it, how it burdens employers. And with that, um, as, as long as the recommendations are flowing, obviously one of the things that we would be very concerned about is that we still try to drive towards the employer sponsor insurance model because that's what allows 
businesses to be able to compete. We don't want the small business community to essentially be the employers of, of public option employees while the larger employers offer all the great benefits to be able to attract and retain. And, and along those lines also, we would be just as concerned about a, a coverage mandate for the small business community because in the end, this this same question of cost is is it, it very much can put businesses under. We've done our surveys of our membership of over the last six months, how they've fared in the current economy. We've had an 11 a report of 11 percent of business of survey respondents saying they've dropped health care coverage for their employees in the last six months. It was a bit bit of a shocking number for us too. Um, and I guess while we're talking about, for instance, a voluntary public option, and again, I would, overstate, I would restate that it's a surprise to us that we would be talking about this, is that we also make sure that if we're talking about universal coverage overall, that we don't forget that 22% of the uninsured population is non-citizens. And we can't really talk about universal coverage unless we make sure that the non-citizen populations are covered. I don't know anybody that's traveled to Europe as a vacation or I've never been charged a dollar when I've gone to a European uh, hospital. I would like to think that uh, we can consider uh, non-citizen populations in this country, many of which contribute to our productivity, an essential part of the labor force and of our communities that need coverage. Thanks, David. I think we're toward the end of our time. Jane, you, you want to say what? Closing somebody, brought, somebody brought up that you know they may have to go to individual coverage, and I would just like to stress that I compared the two before I got group coverage, and there's huge differences in what's covered, and it's not adequate when you get an individual policy. When you go to eInsurance.com and get your little policy at half what the group rate was, that's because they're covering a lot less. Um, they don't cover prescription drugs. They don't cover, you know a lot of procedures and so that's not a viable option. So many people are forced with having to be in a group in order to get adequate coverage, which means the small businesses are forced to set it up if they feel for their employees at all and then we have to pay. And the, the, the amount of unfairness in terms of this state versus that state and what you're going to pay if you, you're in business here and what you're going to pay if you're in business there is huge. So bare minimum, we need national rules for rating because if I had opened in Maryland, my rates would be a lot less than what I'm paying in DC. And we're talking about two miles down the road. So there needs to be reform on all aspects in terms of how the insurance companies decide what to charge you and what they're basing that on. And it shouldn't just be because you happen to open up in this state and you happen to have unhealthy employees or your employee's workforce is over 50 because you specialize in senior dancing. You know, it shouldn't <laughs> matter. And unfortunately, that's what we get dealt is this hand of, you know, these are your employees and so now you're gonna, you're gonna have to pay. And it's a choice between hiring another person or not hiring another person. Am I gonna make it or am I not gonna make it? And it's very real. And it shouldn't be whether or not we should do this, but how are we gonna do this? Yeah, I agree. Terry, I'm gonna give you a last word and then we're gonna, I think, have to wrap up here. Um, one of the things I know everybody's looking at is an exchange or connector to pool small business. And I think it's very important that we keep in mind as we design that, that we're designing it to work for, who is it? 21 million self-employed, 6 million small businesses and 80% of them are under 10 employees. It's gotta be, real simple, real accessible to be practically available. We can also look to the fact that Japan set up a small business pool 30 years ago, and we know their healthcare costs are half of ours, and they have good outcomes, and they have a very robust small business sector. So we can see that this can work, but we gotta make sure we know who we're designing it for so that we get a lot of choices and competitions and not fall into maybe 50 state connectors because we got small states, we have rural areas where you aren't gonna get the competition unless it's designed with all of our small businesses in mind. Thanks. I just wanna thank everybody for coming here and 
for the work you're doing as small business owners and also for sharing your stories and being willing to spend the time helping us to understand what you're facing. And, you know, I'm left with a lot of, of um, stories from this. Mark, what you said about your family business having been around since your dad founded it 50 years ago and your, your feeling of shared responsibility and wanting to continue providing and yet the struggle that you're facing. And Jody, you started us off talking about your dream of your cupcake business, and you're now up to five stores, is that right? And four stores. Four stores. Mm -hmm. But being unable to move forward and grow and get bigger, in part because of the, the obligation you feel and responsibility you feel to help your employees with health insurance and just unable to keep up with the rising costs. So, um, that leaves me even more committed, and I know Larry had the same reaction to let's get this done this year. We really need your help. I hope you'll all hang in there and, and keep working at it and keep in touch with us as you continue to, to do what you're doing and provide health care and, and help us get this done this year. So thank you very much. <laughs>